Ivan then asked them if the group plans to work or to continue their education. This wasn't exactly something that either of them had thought about. As I mentioned in the previous chapter, these people have no long-term plan here. Heck, even when they were all squatting in the cave, they had no long-term plans. Like, literally none. It's honestly kind of maddening. Hello and welcome to Percontation Points Video Snark. If you came here because you thought that this was an audiobook, please stick around and maybe learn some reading and listening comprehension skills. I read books, discuss what aren't wrong, and how they can possibly be fixed. I'm continuing my read-through of the Color Theory series by Ashley Busamonte. Not the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. Chapter 17 when she gets to the other side, Ava inhales, deeply surprised that she can actually breathe the air. She also can't help but note how blue that the sky is. The, the barrier muted the color, so everything seems so much different without it. Also, I guess Trisha and Hazel came with them. I was under the impression that the two of them had stayed behind to go back to the adults, but whatever. Anyway, now that they're all on the other side, Ava tells the group that they're focusing on freeing the rest of the mentalists and that they're out from Selena's gaze. But she understands that if anybody feels like this is not their mission and doesn't want to do this. A Elm explains that yes, it is mainly mentalists at this camp, but that there are also augmenters and shapers as well. Then they walk for an entire page, and it's tedious and boring, and I wish that I had simply skipped ahead. Eventually, Sammy suggests that they should make camp for the night since the colony is another two-hour walk away. That is obviously disheartening to hear, but Ava rallies their spirits by reminding them that it's only two hours first thing in the morning. The next morning, when Ava wakes up, she hears an odd but benign sound in the distance. She and Elm go investigate and stumble upon the beach. Since they've both been in Magnus their entire lives, neither have obviously seen the ocean ever. The two of them get their feet wet, collect shells, and generally experience the ocean for the first time. Their moment of peaceful quiet is quickly over when the others show up to discover the beach as well. An hour of frolicking later, the group decides that they need to move on. However, as they continue on, Ava begins to regret their decision to play on the beach for so long. Now they're hungry and a little dehydrated, but also dirty, covered in sand, and sunburned. When they get closer, Trisha suggests that she and Hazel, aka the only actual adults in the group, should go first to ensure that these people are ready for the children. However, Sammy insists that they're her people and that they'll accept the group so long as they stand against Celine. As they continue on, they start to see skyscrapers, which... Okay, I was expecting a few houses and maybe some shops. A colony, not a massive city. Chapter 18 why is the sight of a towering city so surprising? Somehow I expected a ragtag group of tents or other makeshift shelters. I mean, same. Sammy is at ease when she sees her home and eagerly leads them towards the guard gate. The guards station there casually greet Sammy and welcomes everybody once Sammy explains who they are. Elm is signaled out, which he doesn't exactly seem to like. Inside, Sammy explains that they've called the city Neo Prism as a way to reclaim what was stolen from them. Ava marvels over the sparkling streets, but Sammy scoffs over the idea that mentalists would want to maintain that kind of illusion 24-7. As they go, they pass a street performer in all yellow who is entertaining a group of children with multicolored fish. Ava asks why it is that everybody can't see through the illusion, but Elm explains that it's different when you know that the illusion is only meant to entertain. This sends Ava spiraling down a bunch of dark thoughts about how mentalists would get close to targets for years in order to make convincing enough illusions to fool them, but then she stops those thoughts and tells herself to stop thinking like that, especially in a city full of mentalists. The people they pass by on the street give them a wide berth. They pass by some restaurants and Trisha announces that she'll buy everybody food with her credit card, aka a currency card. But Sammy scoffs over the idea since the city that but Sammy scoffs over the idea since the city that exists outside of the realm of Magnus obviously doesn't have the same kind of monetary system. Instead, she gives the adults some paper money, but tells Emma and Ava that they'll continue on with her to meet the leader of Neo Prism, Ivan. And I have to say that it's kind of weird that they let like 40 people into the city, but the guard failed to actually notify anybody that this huge group would be coming in. Like, yeah, Sammy is with them, but still. Ex exactly what's her long-term plan here for things like food and shelter? Sammy gets into a self-driving car thing like they have in Magnus, but unlike in Magnus, this one doesn't require any sort of ID to travel. The idea of the government not giving a who what you spend your money on or where you go is certainly to Ava. As they go, Ava begins the question of trusting Sammy is seriously the right choice here. She doesn't really decide either way, but is reassured when Elm reminds her that he's by her side no matter what. They go to a building where Sammy says that she needs to talk to Ivan alone for a moment. As they wait, Ava worries that she's not exactly at her best, but Elm assures her that she looks fine. Sammy comes out, says that she's going home, and that Ivan will take care of things from here. 
Chapter 19. Inside the office, Ava is accosted by a large but friendly dog. Ivan assures her that the dog is a cinnamon roll. Naturally, Ivan has heard of Elm, but he's also equally impressed by what little he's heard of Ava, if only because she's fighting against Celine. He goes on to say that Neil Prism is happy in his current stalemate against Magnus, that as long as the group doesn't rock the boat, he doesn't seem to care what happens. He explains that before the mentalist genocide, people used to be able to come and go freely between the two cities, but things have been changing, both on the island as well as the rest of the world. When Ava asks, Ivan tells her that they have no more communication with anybody anymore. He kind of hand waves away a lot of with a generic excuse of natural disasters with no further context, which I have to say at least some thought is given to what's going on in the rest of the world. If I had to read another book in which children were being tasked to murder each other in North America, but the rest of the world was nothing but a giant question mark... But he does say that strange weather phenomena have been happening on the island. The wild animals are restless. Plants are growing at odd times. The weather is all over the place. Ava thinks about the sunflowers lasting from the middle of spring to the end of fall and thinks that it explains it. But she isn't sure how she's supposed to fight climate change. Ivan then asks them if the group plans to work or to continue their education. This wasn't exactly something that either of them had thought about. As I mentioned in the previous chapter, these people have no long-term plan here. Heck, even when they were all squatting in the cave, they had no long-term plans. Like, literally none. It's honestly kind of maddening. When Ava and Elm hint that they'd like to go back to Magnus to continue the fight, Ivan is again like, I really don't care so long as you don't metaphorically rock Neo Prism's boat. He says that he'll put all of them up in empty apartments and give them a bit of money to help them get started in exchange for info about Celine. Ava agrees without hesitation. As they leave, Ava and Um express disappointment over how that meeting went. They are also concerned with how little Ivan seems to care about the stuff that's going on inside Magnus. Disappointing, I suppose, is the best word for it. We finally find other mentalists, and I thought certainly we would have allies, but, but instead they are entirely unconcerned with what's happening inside of the barrier. They met literally one person in a city full of people. Go make some other friends. Surely not everybody has the same political opinions as Ivan. However, they're also quick to wonder that if they did make some allies in the city, would Ivan let them assist the Magnus Rebellion? They're of the opinion that Ivan is a big supporter of free will, but it's still kind of questionable. They meet up with the others who save them some food. Ava goes over to where Sarah is crying or from the rest of the group. As you can imagine, Sarah is beside herself with guilt over what happened. Trisha comes over and says that she wished that she'd done more to stop things from getting this out of hand. Ava also expresses guilt that her accidental connection with Celine went in reverse and Celine learned of the cave from Ava. The group is approached by a girl who introduces herself as Maribel and calls them domers, which is fair enough, I suppose. She's there to escort them to their new apartments. At the station, there are a bunch of people clearly waiting to see the group. Eva feels anxious about them, but Maribel goes out and tells everybody to clear out on Ivan's orders, so they do. They go to a new building, which Maribel explains was put up for refugees coming from Magnus. Now that people have figured out how to bypass the dome, Ivan had been expecting for people to start fleeing to Neo Prism. This isn't discussed further, but I have so many questions. First off, it, was it Sammy who went in and started telling everybody she could about how to get in and out? Or when she figured it out, did she tell the others at home how to do it and they started to spread the word? They all get assigned their own small studio apartment, so Ava is alone for the first time in months. She showers, but when she gets into bed, she feels weird and jumpy when she hears voices out in the hall. She has to remind herself that she's pretty safe here, far away from Celine and any benefactors. Chapter 20 the next morning, Ava meets up with Elma outside of her new apartment. He asks if she's anxious and jumpy and admits that he is too. They join the others across the street for breakfast, so they tell Ava and Elm that breakfast is on Ivan. Ava thinks that all of Ivan's kindness is something that has a whole lot of metaphorical strings attached and worries that nobody else seems to be worried about that. They tuck into their breakfast, which contains yellow eggs. As Ava finishes up her meal, she notices that there's a lot of people outside. She wonders if this is normal for her city and thinks that maybe they're all simply trying to go to work. But a moment later, Maribel comes in and says that everybody outside are reporters or looky-loos and that it would be great if they could give quick interviews. Ava agrees to go talk to them and Maribel insists that Elm should go too. The others are quick to say that they want nothing to do with any of this and leave this up to Elm and Ava. Outside, people ask questions like if Celine is dead, if all the mentalists are dead, if Jace is still being a traitor, and if Elm is single. The last is asked by a group of teenage girls that Maribel is quick to show away. When a reporter asks for their names, Maribel is quick to give it to the group. 
This arouses Eva since she didn't remember telling Ivan her name at all, which is um, a little rude if you ask me. Normal people introduce themselves, at least by their first name, but this makes Eva wonder exactly how much Ivan knows about their group. Even um, kind of brush over the fence of the first book. It's kind of standard stuff, so I won't get into it. But then somebody calls out, Did you say that your name was Locke? Eva looks over and is completely and utterly floored to see people that she thinks are her parents. Thanks for listening to my book snooker on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snorts, always free and updated every morning. Your only edit to Patreon is to become a member without paying. You'll get access to the same things on Tumblr, but on Patreon. Supporters can have access to so many more book snorts starting at $1 a month. Also new is a one-week free Patreon trail, so be sure to check that out. Special thanks to Don, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. Also, a huge shout out to Bunker Bash for making a sizable one-time donation. Thanks! If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well. Just $10 per chapter. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of spicy short stories and two full-length novels. I also frequently run flash sales on my stories, and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys!